your man, Louis T. Welcome to the command post. You know what it is. Post up. Take command. I, of course, am your commander in chief, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to tackle today and a couple of items we'll save for tomorrow's live show. So first things first, the overwhelming responses to the question that I posed last week um, was amazing. And to so much so that I have some more that I want to read today. Last episode was strictly dedicated to just reading your comments regarding the biggest mistake that Ron Rivera has made during his tenure here in Washington to this point. And uh, the outpouring of support for that uh, particular video has been outstanding. And, you know, the, the comments that were made, very insightful, thoughtful. And um, I love when conversations get started and then and then they just kind of grow and, and take on a life of their own, which is what this has effectively done. That said, uh, there are a couple more comments that I want to read regarding this, and then we're going to debt it. We're going to leave it where it is, and then we're going to move on to something else, because I have another question for you today that I will pose to you. I'll give you my answer tomorrow on the show, live tomorrow night, um, and, and a couple of other topics that we'll tackle tomorrow on the show. Uh, Ron Rivera golfing. You know, he's going to be at the Pebble Beach Pro-Am um, this weekend. Aaron Rodgers will be in attendance, among other, uh, you know, celebrities. Are you offended by this? Th th is this a problem for you? We'll talk about that tomorrow. We'll talk about Greg Curl, the father of Cam Curl, um, putting out, you know, a, a number as to what he feels like his son should be paid on an extension. And uh, I talked a lot about that on my guy, uh, Protect Sports' show, Tones, if you want to check it out. Uh, we had a, a lengthy discussion on that, uh, and I'll probably be regurgitating much of that information. So if you go over there, you'll see how I feel about it. But we'll talk about it more tomorrow uh, night as well, in addition to some more offensive coordinator discussion and dialogue and some of this. So let's talk about these comments regarding Ron Rivera and the biggest mistake that he has made. I have a couple more that I wanted to read real quick before uh, we move on and turn the page from this. So uh, this is from my guy, Derek B. Uh, Derek B writes, how is my saying Ron selecting Young over Herbert is hindsight, but everyone else's isn't? The entire video is about hindsight. You need to rephrase the question to what was Ron's biggest mistake that Louis T didn't agree with at the time. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but back when Ron cut Haskins, I said that the number two pick should have been a quarterback. Ron was never 100 um, on Haskins and should have had the balls to say so to Dan. This was while Chase was winning Defensive Rookie of the Year. I don't remember that conversation. I'm, I'm not denying that it happened. But everyone's got hindsight 2020, right, vision. And to your point, a lot of what we're discussing – it's hindsight. So, it, 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 and I, I think I made a mention of it. I kind of dismissed the Herbert thing, but I'm, I wasn't dismissing it in the sense of um, people didn't feel that way at the time because there were people who felt that way. I wasn't one of them. I was on board with Chase Young. Most people at that time didn't have Justin Herbert. Clearly, the league spoke. If, if people felt the way that they feel about Justin Herbert now, then he would not have fallen to number six or seven or wherever he went in that draft, okay? He would have gone number two behind Joe Burrow. Someone would have traded up with Washington and gotten themselves the number two pick, or Washington themselves would have selected him. Obviously, that's what would have occurred. Washington would have taken him, and they would have gotten rid of Dwayne Haskins, right? But that's not what happened. That's not how people viewed Justin Herbert at that time. And so that's kind of why I'm saying, you know, it's easy to say that now. But in the conversation that we're having, that does qualify as a mistake, not taking Justin Herbert. I'm just saying that keep in mind, because it's easy to say that now, keep in mind that in that moment, if we go back in the time machine to 2020, April of 2020, not many people were clamoring for Ron to take a quarterback then. There were some, and you may have been one of them. But there weren't many. That's that's the the argument that I'm making is that it was a mistake. Clearly, we can sit here and if we knew what Herbert was going to turn into, no one would have been clamoring for Chase Young. But we didn't know at that time. And we said, let's see what Dwayne has. We were in, somewhat impressed with what he did to finish up the 19 season. So I think there was a bit of intrigue surrounding Dwayne. 
going into that 2020 season, and, and you can't forget all of those things. But them changing offensive coordinators didn't help Dwayne's development. I don't think, and I think you're spot on here, I don't think Ron ever 100% was bought into Dwayne Haskins as the starter, but I think he did that as a solid to Dan. When he took the job, he told Dan he would try and make it work with Dwayne first. It didn't. They moved on. So, yeah. Um, Jesse Anto writes, Rivera has done an excellent job of creating new culture and building a great locker room of young men with intelligence and integrity. They truly enjoy playing with each other and have chemistry. He also had to deal with all of the previous regimes and ownerships, horrible practices and dealings publicly. He handled it with honor and class. My problem with Ron is his lackadaisical approach. The slow starts to games and seasons, heading into last season with huge holes at linebacker, offensive line, and DB without addressing any of them, just kind of crossing his fingers and hoping it would work out. Slow reactions into in-game adjustments the need to be made that need to be made immediately. There also seems to be a lack of true plan for the future as well. It appears they roll with the punches and try to adapt instead of having a plan B through Z. I think that is as well constructed a comment regarding Ron Rivera as I've seen to this point. I think that kind of encapsulates whether you agree with it or not. I think that comment there truly encapsulates what Ron Rivera's tenure has been about. I think he hit on just about every point. People don't give Ron enough credit for changing the culture. They don't give him enough credit for some of the things that he's built within this organization from a roster standpoint. This team is better. That was a low bar. I will admit that, and I've said that numerous times. The bar was very low. He didn't have to do much to improve the roster. It was terrible when he got here. That said, it could still be terrible, just slightly better. It's not. It's much better. We're still missing, you know, num a number of positions that need to be filled, that need to be better. But this roster has come a long way. And so, and, and, and to his point, there are no more new Sua Cravens being drafted. There are no more Darius Geises being drafted here. This is a team with guys with integrity that represent the organization the right way, that do it the right way, which is what we want, Okay. So that also is something that needs to be taken into consideration. He came into this situation having to deal with a lot of shit. We've talked about this. And a lot of the things he had to deal with was blowback from things that happened before he got here, which he's mentioned several times. But that goes to show that he really didn't know what he was getting himself into. Because you can't get here and then say, hey, judge me on what I do. Don't worry about the past. That's not how this particular job here works. You may be able to go to... Cleveland, or you may be able to go to Green Bay, or you may be able to go to Indianapolis and, and use that line and have it work. Maybe Carolina, where you came from, you were able to use that line, and, and the media just said, okay, we'll give you a shot, Ron. That doesn't work here in Washington. There's too many demons and skeletons from the past that always come back to haunt us, and now you have to deal with that. They're going to be laid right on your doorstep, and you're going to have to open up your door at some point and deal with them. Anyway, um, the slow starts to the seasons, to games, that's one of the biggest problems, obviously. Um, and I really think the end of this comment here, you know, going into the season last year with, you're not going to, and this is the thing, you know, a lot of people were frustrated. You're not going to be able to fill every single need that you have when you have as many as we had going into last season. And, and the ones that we have this year um, may not be all filled when it's all said and done. It's hard to fill. You got seven different holes or positions of need on your right. It's hard to fill all of them in one off season, you know, free agency, the draft, all that is good, but you're not going to hit on every single guy that you bring in to fill in holes. So you may still have some holes. You just got to hope that guys stay healthy. Things work out in, in certain instances for Ryan. It didn't. That said, I think the biggest part of this comment that really resonates with me in particular is him just kind of crossing his fingers and hoping it works out. You know, I I've, felt like this with Ron that he told us that this this had this rebuild this re, this culture building um episode you know turning this program into a winner was a 3 to 5 year um process and journey and i don't think he ever had 
the, the three to five year plan in place. I think year one, and I've said this a million times, felt like year one altered his plans and it never should have. Winning that division gave them a false sense. It almost gave them a Bruce Allen-like sense of we're close. We weren't close in 2020. We were, we were closer to being 1 and, and 15 than we were 10 or 11 and, and 5 or 10 and 6. We were awful in 2020. We were just the best of the worst of the NFC East. And for some inexplicable reason, whatever plan that he did have, if he did have one at all, he veered away from it in, in a pursuit of speeding up the process by going out and getting Ryan Fitzpatrick and, and, and William Jackson III and, and, and Curtis Samuel and trying to speed the process up. And it was an epic fail. Um, <clears throat> even now, these off seasons have been so disappointing because they've been so desperate for quarterback and they don't really have a plan. Hey, if we can't get this guy or we can't get this guy, here's our next plan of action. They're kind of just going, waiting to see how the, the game of musical chairs at the quarterback position kind of plays itself out. And whatever guy's left, we'll get that guy. That's kind of how it felt with Carson Wentz last year. Can't get this guy, can't get that guy, can't get this guy. This guy doesn't want to come here. Let's get Carson Wentz. He's the only one really left. That's, that's a losing formula. You know, but anyway, um, I thought that was a really good comment from Jess Anto. Um, Ronald Tillman writes, I know I'm late, but the biggest mistake that he made was not trading up in the draft for Justin Fields, which I stated this on the platform at the time after his first season here. They should have traded one of their D linemen a first and probably a third to make that trade happen. Remember, Ron said in the post-draft presser, that they inquired about trading up for Justin Fields. They acquired, well, not Fields in particular, but a quarterback. I think the quarterback that we can all um, infer, right, that he was referring to and deduce was Justin Fields. You weren't going to get Trey Lance, you weren't going to get Trevor Lawrence, and you weren't going to get Zach Wilson. So they called up to see what it would take to move up to get Fields, and they didn't like the response. And maybe that response sounded like a lineman, a first and a third and they weren't with it because Ron said that the, the price was a bit too steep for him that meant they didn't love Justin Fields that's all that meant if you love a guy you'll pay whatever price is being thrown out there if you feel like this is the guy that's going to you know win me a ton of games if he felt like Justin Fields had Cam Newton like ability he would have made that deal he didn't view Justin Fields in that light which is why he didn't pull the trigger so um, and maybe he was wrong about that. We'll see. Because Fields, if nothing else, he's shown the ability to be a playmaker. I still don't love him as a passer of the football. Maybe that will come. But in the meantime, continue to make big plays and give your team a chance with your legs until the arm starts to catch up. He's doing that. And, I mean, it's the same formula for Lamar Jackson. You know, it took his arm a while to catch up to what his legs was doing. But in, in the meantime, I'm going to continue to make big plays with my legs. Till my arm catches up. So we'll see. Washington football enjoyer says, his biggest mistake, not drafting Herbert. We heard that a lot. And that's probably the biggest mistake, honestly. If we're, if, if we're going to play that game, which that's the game we're playing, if you draft, and again, we can't be certain that if you draft Justin Herbert here, he turns into Justin Herbert. Okay? We draft Justin Herbert here in 2020. There's a chance that we could have destroyed him and turned him into, I don't know, um, Paxton Lynch. I mean, our organization has been and still is trash. So who's to say that we get our hands on this kid and we don't spoil him and we don't turn him rotten and don't have him out of the league in five or six years? Anyway, I digress. But, yeah, that, that's a big one. If, if you're getting the same Justin Herbert that the Chargers got, then, yeah, that's a mistake, obviously, the biggest one, clearly. 
Uh, Lance Eubank writes, Chase Young over Herbert or Tua and Scott Turner. I think the Tua thing, you got to remember, he was coming off of a hip surgery. And <coughs> one of the biggest problems with Tua is he wasn't able to stay healthy in college and he hasn't been able to stay healthy in the NFL. So I, I don't really look back at that one and say, yeah, we should have done that. Even though Tua went healthy is way better than anything we've had, clearly. But I digress. Um, got a couple more here that I wanted to get to before we uh, moved on. Or maybe it was just one more that I wanted to get to. I think it was one more. So this one is a good one. So I wanted to read this. It's from King of the North, our guy King of the North, who writes, None of those comments actually pointed out Ron's biggest mistake. His biggest mistake was how he approached this job to begin with. Ron felt assured that Dan was going to give him five years, and that caused him to have a lack of urgency in the first few years here. This, in my opinion, is the underlying mistake that caused most of his other mistakes. Ron told us from the start it takes three to five years to turn a culture around. He told us about building up the roster and then finding the right quarterback. He really thought he could make incremental changes every year and that would build into a contender by year three or four. Then year three came and he still didn't have his QB, so he got desperate and he traded for Wentz. During year three, he realized he had made a mistake being patient with Scott, hoping he would grow into a great OC. Also, there was little to no depth at certain positions this season because Ron chose to take a long-term approach with developing young players instead of signing free agents. Now Ron is about to go into an absolute must-win year or be fired by a new owner. I can't help but think if he would have had more sense of urgency in years one and two, we, he would be better prepared to do what it takes to keep his job this year. I love this comment. I don't agree with everything that is said in it, but I think this is a well-constructed and, to your point, a, a conversation that really hasn't been brought up, and I think it is one that needs to be talked about more um i've referenced the fact that ron has where where i disagree i, I think i agree with every single thing you said in this comment except <clears throat> excuse me that he was patient in years uh in year two in particular i thought that he was feeling the pressure of I need to follow up with a division win season. Like we won the division in 2020 in his first year here. I need to follow that up with something more than, because it, it, so let's say if the division was um, one at 11 and five his first year and Washington finished at seven and, and nine, like we did, there wouldn't have been any expectations. People wouldn't have been talking about look out for Washington and adding a guy like Ryan Fitzpatrick wouldn't have added the expectation that it did. And he could have continued to build this thing the way that he wanted to. I thought he actually tried to rush things, you know, in year two. I thought that he tried to expedite the process in year two instead of making incremental changes. You know, when are we ever that aggressive in free agency? He went out and he signed... Not one impactful, you know, free agent, but really two. And then he really started to scrub this organization clean of things that he saw maybe festering and really started to go for it. Like signing Curtis Samuel, that's a move that you make when you think you're getting close to doing something, right? Signing William Jackson III and not keeping Ronald Darby, that was a big move, right? Getting rid of, of um, Morgan Moses and bringing in Cornelia or um, Charles Leno Jr. Like, and then getting Ryan Fitzpatrick. Like, they were really trying to push this roster forward like that. If you were really trying to build this thing brick by brick, piece by piece, I don't know. Maybe Curtis Samuel is a guy that you really targeted. You see that we need receiver help. You bring him in. He's young. That makes sense. William Jackson III, young, going into the prime of his career. Okay, get it. But it felt like those moves were made and they were trying. Like, it, that felt like what Cincinnati did the year that they went to the Super Bowl, which was 2021, right? That offseason, 
They went out and got Trey Hendrickson. They went out and got Mike Hilton. They went out and got uh, Von Bell. They went out and got all of these players, right? I could go on and on and on with all the guys that they added to that football team to make them to Dobia Wuzier at corner. They went out and they revamped that team in the pursuit of expediting the process because they had their quarterback and they felt like they could get it done. I think they thought Ryan Fitzpatrick was going to come in here, help reshape the offense, make it more dynamic. They added De'Ami Brown. They added Curtis Samuel. They already had Terry. They thought Logan Thomas was going to be this big-time tight end. He was coming off of a huge campaign in 2020. J.D. McKissick, pass-catching threat. Antonio Gibson showed flashes of being great in his rookie season. I think he thought he was going to speed the process up. I don't think he was being patient in year two. And it backfired. If there were no expectations in year two, he, I think he would have stayed the course, which is what ultimately would have led to us being in a better position in year three to strike. Felt rushed in year two to me, personally. But to your point, um, I think Ron did feel like he was going to have time. And I think it really showed when you look at how he's treated specific positions, i.e. cornerback, i.e. linebacker. These are positions that he could have gone out and gotten veteran players at. And not John Bostic and David Mayo veterans. I'm talking about guys that help you win football games. Those guys are placeholder linebackers, guys that help you on special teams and help some of your younger players develop. Those aren't players that you need to be playing real minutes, real snaps. And they were. Um, corner, he went long game. To your point, you know, Castro Fields and Rashad Wild Goose, instead of going out and getting a veteran cornerback that can help you win right now. And so um, I, I do think there's a lot of truth in what was said. I don't agree with year two being kind of, you know, incremental change. I think they've swung for the fences. They tried to get Matthew Stafford in year two. Remember that. Like, if you're really trying to build it the right way, then you're not swinging for Matthew Stafford in year two. To me. You know, you go after that, you keep building the roster, and then year three is when you look to strike at the quarterback position. But they swung after Stafford, they missed. They swung after Russell Wilson in year three and missed, and that, I think, did trigger a lot of the moves, including going out and getting wins. So I agree with everything except I don't think year two was as patient. But I do think he was moving at a pace that didn't match the urgency that was necessary because he didn't expect uh, D Daniel Snyder to sell. He didn't expect to be in this position. He was, if Daniel Snyder was here, he would have gotten five years and maybe then some because he was the face of the franchise, essentially. Now with a new coach uh, or a new ownership group coming in potentially, this is it, to your point. Um, it's a great comment, um, and I love the part about Scott Turner, hoping that he would develop into an elite offensive coordinator. That never came to fruition. Ron had every reason to believe that Scott could get it done because year one was Scott's best year, if you ask me. He was creative. He was innovative. He had less to work with, and he got more out of that less to me. You look at 2021, you got more weapons, but it, it still remained the same on offense because – Curtis was hurt. Diami was a rookie. So you were still leaning on Terry. But this time he didn't have help. There was no Logan Thomas. J.D. McKissick got hurt late in the season. So the offense was kind of compromised. Antonio Gibson took a step back from his rookie season in 2021. Even though he rushed for more yards, he wasn't as productive. He didn't score as many touchdowns. We weren't as good in the red zone. He got worse as a coordinator in 2021, Scott Turner did. And he got even worse with more weapons and more options in 2022. So um, he, he hung in there thinking Scott would turn it around, and he never did. And I, I agree with that as well. Great comment by King of the North. Um, these are the types of conversations I love having with you guys because it opens up, you know, everyone's thought process to different things that you may not have considered uh, when making some of these um, decisions on how you feel about Ron Rivera or anyone else within the organization. That said... Uh, I wanted to throw this out at you guys. What? Because as soon as the Super Bowl is over, we're turning the page on 2022 
and we are focusing in on 2023 and we're moving forward. So I, I want to continue to look back at the season that was because once we close that book in that chapter, there won't be many times I'll be looking to go back. I'll be looking in front of me and not looking in the rear view. So here's another opportunity to look in the rear view from 2022. And I want to ask you guys, for you, what was the biggest what the f moment? What was the biggest what the F moment in the season? It could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. For me, it's a bad thing. I'm just going to tell you that right now. For you, it could be a good thing. Like, oh, my God, we beat the Colts on the last second bomb and quarterback sneak. Oh, my God. I think Washington was something like one in 132 in situations like that where they were trailing by two scores with less than five minutes in the game. So, the, obviously, we don't do those types of things. Whatever that number was, it was a crazy number. Um, what is the biggest what the F moment in 2022 for you? I'll give you mine tomorrow on the show live. In addition, we'll talk about Ron Rivera golfing and the, the optics of that and how I feel and, and, and we'll you know get to how you guys feel about that. Um, and while the Senior Bowl is going on, while they're still searching for an offensive coordinator, all of that, and then we'll get to Cam Curl and, you know, what's a good number for Cam Curl? You know, is his dad being irrational or do you have to find a way to do whatever it takes to get Cam Curl back on this football team? The sooner you do it, the better. I'll just say that. We'll talk more about that and more tomorrow on the show. Look forward to chopping up with you. Leave those comments down in the comment section of this video. Should be fun hearing what you guys have to say in terms of what was the biggest what the F moment of 2022. See you guys on Thursday live for the command post. Until then, you know what it is. Post up and take command. You guys have a good one. Network.